This episode is sponsored by Magisterium AI, the world's number one AI-powered guide to church teaching. Query our knowledge base of over 9,000 magisterial and Catholic theological texts and discover how AI is supercharging access to church teaching. Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux and your host here on Last Week in the Church, the show where we sort through the flotsam and jetsam, the ever-present avalanche and torrent of news on the Vatican beat, and try to get our hands around those few stories that actually matter. Here's what we've got for you on the menu this week. We begin with the other shoe drops. Having threatened to excommunicate Arch Italian Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, the Vatican followed through on its promise this past week, declaring on Friday that the day before, a decree of excommunication had been issued against Vigano, both for what he had done as, and, as it turns out, what he had failed to do. We will explain what happens and, you know, what it might all mean, if anything, as part of our presentation this week. All right. Second up this week, we have got a grand irony. This past Sunday, Port Francis was in the Italian city of Trieste, to deliver a kind of Jeremiah, a prophetic lament against what he described as the declining health of democracy, on the same day that French voters delivered a result with which one would presume the Pope would actually be fairly pleased. We will explain what the Pope said and the irony of its juxtaposition with the French referendum. Third up this week, we've got a vichyssois of verdicts. So the Vatican's top prosecutor, veteran Italian attorney and layman Alessandro Didi last December, won a historic victory in the Vatican's trial of the century, securing convictions against nine of the 10 defendants in the trial, including for the very first time, a cardinal of the Catholic Church. Yet today, he is facing verdicts on at least four separate fronts, which may yet spell snatching defeat from the jaws of that apparent victory, we'll explain what's going on and what the potential impact on Didi's effectiveness and his legacy might be. Finally this week, we've got a penitential pilgrimage. For the last 11 years, ladies and gentlemen, since March of 2013, there have been a bevy of pundits and provocateurs in the Catholic Church who have made a nice living off of pitting Benedict and Francis against one another. I'm going to suggest a pilgrimage that that block might undertake that would change their perspective and cleanse their souls. All that and more is waiting for you on this edition of Last Week in the Church. So please, for the love of God, in the name of the angels and saints, and both in the name of St. Benedict and St. Francis, don't go anywhere because we will be right back. All right, everybody, happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, July 9th, 2024. Hope you are having a great summer wherever you are. We begin this week with the other shoe drops. So last week on this show, we discussed the fact that the Vatican, more specifically, the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith under Argentine Cardinal Victor Fernandez, had announced its intention to excommunicate Italian Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, former, Vatican, former Secretary General of the Vatican City State, then the former papal envoy to the United States, had threatened to excommunicate him for the crime of schism unless he answered a summons to appear in the offices of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith on June 20th. Now, June 20th came and went. Vigano did not show up. He actually posted on his social media accounts the decree ordering him to come. He described the charge of schism against Pope Francis as an honor, taking obvious delight in it. The dicastery granted him a few days as a grace period. But then this past Friday, they put out a statement announcing that the day before the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith had conducted a meeting in which the administrative procedure, so not a canonical trial, not a formal trial under church law, but an administrative procedure for the what's known as the reserved delict, 
is the, the kind of serious crime of schism with regard to Vigano had been held, was determined in a shocking twist. It was determined that he was guilty. And so they went ahead and announced his excommunication. Now, just as a little bit of linguistic precision here, many news outlets have reported that the Vatican has excommunicated Vigano. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but as a technical and pretty pedantic matter, this is what's known as a late sententiae excommunication, which means that the excommunication, that is separation from communion with the church and the faith, is automatic. It is triggered by the act itself. So to be technical, the Vatican would argue that it's not that they excommunicated Vigano. They would say Vigano excommunicated himself. They are simply recognizing that fact. But however you slice it, the Vatican has said out loud that Vigano is no longer one of us. He's not kosher anymore. He's not on the bus. He's not part of the club. He doesn't have a seat at the table. He's cast out. He's gone. Okay? Now, is there anything particularly surprising about this? Well, again, as we talked about last week, the Vatican had said it was going to do this. So, no, not particularly shocking. Second, you know, is it reasonable to conclude that Vigano brought this on himself? Well, we are talking about a guy who, in 2018, not only accused the Pope of covering up sexual abuse committed by former cardinal and former priest Theodore McCarrick, but publicly called upon him to resign, and then since 2018, has progressively taken step after step into the world of sort of black helicopter-esque conspiracy theories, including, you know, pretty much every negative conclusion about Pope Francis you could possibly reach, including the claim that he is not actually legitimately the Pope because he has a different understanding of the papacy. So when he gave his consent in 2013, it wasn't to the papacy as the church understands it, and therefore he's not really fully legitimate. Now, look, I am not an expert, but that seems fairly schismatic to me. If you're running around saying the Pope is not only wrong about everything, but he's not only the Pope, he's not actually the Pope, yeah, you know, I would say you're probably, you know, not on the team, right? And so in that sense, there is probably nothing particularly surprising about this. Two things that are of interest, I suppose. One is the question of why now? I mean, you know, Vigano has been running around saying this stuff about Pope Francis for quite some time. So, you know, one way of, one question to ask is why did it take this long to get to this point? The most popular suggestion that has been made is that what triggered this action wasn't so much anything new Vigano had said, but the fact that it has been widely reported and never denied by anyone that Vigano has had himself reordained, that is, reconsecrated a Catholic bishop by Bishop Richard Williamson. Now, you may remember that Williamson was one of four traditionalist bishops of the Society of St. Pius X, who had been declared excommunicate because they were ordained by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, and then those excommunications were lifted under Pope Benedict XVI. Williamson, however, turned out to have a track record as a Holocaust denier, so that became deeply controversial. Eventually, not only was his excommunication by the Catholic Church reimposed for other things he had done, but even the Society of St. Pius X kicked him out. Now, this is how you know you're kind of out there when a group that itself has rebelled against the authority of the Vatican and is considered by the Vatican to be in schism, or at least not in full communion, when even that group is saying, look, you are, you know, you're a little too out there for us. Well, that's where Williamson is, and that is apparently the person to whom the 83-year-old Vigano turned to, you know, reconsecrate him as a Catholic bishop in what he would consider to be fully orthodox fashion. So apparently that's the trigger for all of this. The other footnote I would like to observe. Up to this point, I have been saying that the Vatican excommunicator declared decided that Vigano was excommunicate last Thursday. I have deliberately not been using the actual date, because the actual date 
of this decision was July 4th, 2024. Now, not only is it fairly striking that a former papal ambassador to the United States was declared, was found to be guilty of the crime of schism on American Independence Day, but I would note there is a certain history in the Francis papacy of dropping bombshells on July 4th. You may remember that in 2021, when the Pope went into Rome's Gemelli Hospital for a colon surgery, he did so on July 4th, which not only disrupted, you know, the July 4th holiday, but specifically, it disrupted a July 4th party that my wife Elise and I were staging in Rome in the very space in which this video is being filmed. Once again, the Vatican has done something on the July 4th that meant that Americans, at least Americans who pay attention to the Vatican, you know, had something to talk about other than American Independence Day. Is this entirely coincidence, or is it that there are elements in the Vatican papacy that enjoy messing with American holiday plans? Probably not up to me to decide. You know, as the saying goes, we report, you decide. All right. Second up this week, we have got a grand irony. So on Sunday, Pope Francis was in the Italian city of Trieste to participate in the Italian Catholic Social Week, where he gave a kind of talk, well, a talk that amounts to a kind of checkup on the global health of democracy. Now, just as a parenthesis here, I want to say, if you've never been to Trieste, if you ever have the opportunity to do so, you absolutely should go. It's in northeastern Italy, located on the Adriatic coast, right on the border with Slovenia. It is a fascinating, dynamic place, considered one of the intellectual crossroads of the world. In the early 20th century, literati such as Sigmund Freud and James Joyce hung out there. It was briefly an Anglo-American protectorate after World War II, and to this day, it is said that Trieste has the highest percentage of researchers and academics among its resident population of any city in Europe. Now, how you measure these things, I don't know. But nevertheless, that's what they say. It is a fascinating place. Give the chance to go. Anyway, Pope Francis was there over the weekend. And the theme of the Italian Social Week this year, which is the most important gathering of academics, activists, politicians, clergy, and laity who are inspired by Catholic social teaching, the theme of it this year was democracy. It was actually opened last Wednesday with an address by Italian President Sergio Mattarella, closed on Sunday by Pope Francis. And as I say, Pope Francis delivered a kind of checkup on the state of democracy, and according to him, the news wasn't that great. He said, it is clear that around the world, democracy is, quote, not in good health. And specifically, he said that the problem is there is too much indifference with regard among citizens, with regard to democratic governance, there is a lack of participation. And he also said, you know, that the rise of ideologies has been alarming. Particularly, he cited the rise of populism as something to be concerned about. Now, you know, these are all familiar themes from Pope Francis, of course. But the irony is, the very day that Pope Francis was delivering this address, the nation of France was going to the polls in a runoff election to determine the outcome of snap parliamentary elections called by French President Emmanuel Macron in the wake of historic gains posed by the French far right in elections for the European Parliament in June. Now, in this runoff election, there were two major storylines. One was historically high voter turnout. In other words, anything but indifference and a lack of participation. And number two, the fact that a projected big win for the far right failed to materialize. And in fact, the big winner was the left wing in France. In other words, people who are closer to the Pope's own social and political agenda than virtually any other political formation in the country. You know, some wags suggested that Pope Francis basically delivered a premature oration. Had he simply waited about eight hours or so, he may have had a different take on the state of democracy, at least as it pertains to Europe and specifically as it pertains to France. Now, of course, Francis wasn't simply talking about Europe. 
And the broad, you know, prescription that he laid out certainly has applicability beyond any particular election. Nevertheless, there is kind of an irony that of late things seem to have been going Francis's way in the UK. Okay. Labour won in a historic landslide, Keir Starmer, the new prime minister, who is another figure, who is a kind of moderate but center-left figure whose social and political agenda has a great deal in common with the priority items Francis has been pursuing since his election. Same thing now has kind of unfolded in France, and even though it's hard to know exactly where all this is going to go, it at least would suggest that the rise of far-right nationalist xenophobic populism, which has been Francis's bet noir over the last 11 years, to some extent is being corrected for by the democratic process, raising the question, are things really as bleak as the Pope may have inadvertently made them sound in Trieste? Again, we report, you decide. All right, third up this week, the vicissois of verdicts. So last December, after an avalanche of, after two and a half years, and an avalanche of testimony, witnesses, hearings, procedural squabbles, delays, resumptions, and then more delays, the Vatican's promoter of justice, in other words, it's, it's DA, it's top prosecutor, veteran Italian lawyer, layman Alessandro Didi, finally won convictions in the Vatican's trial of the century for financial fraud related to a $400 million real estate deal in London. Nine of the 10 defendants went down, including Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu, the Pope's former chief of staff. Now, granted, there was a great deal of debate about this trial. Not everyone was satisfied with the outcome. But nevertheless, you know, Didi was able to claim a victory. And at the time, it seemed like the story was finally over. Well, as it turned out, the Trial of the Century is a bit like an American slasher movie. You know those horror movies where you think the villain is dead, but then, surprise, surprise, they pop back up for one last thrust of the knife or swipe with the chainsaw, or, you know, whatever weapon they're using? Well, same thing here. It turns out that the Trial of the Century isn't quite over, actually, because there are verdicts now facing Didi on at least four different fronts, and depending on how things evolve, his apparent win could turn out to be awfully pyrrhic. Number one, there is a civil trial currently underway in the high court in the United Kingdom brought by one of the Italian financiers convicted in the trial of the century, Raffaele Mincione, seeking to have the English court declare that he acted in good faith, in other words, indirectly at least, to say that the Vatican Tribunal got it wrong. This past week, the successor to Beichu as the Pope's chief of staff, Venezuelan Archbishop Edgar Peñapara was in London to testify at this trial. He became the first senior official of Holy See ever to testify in a trial in a foreign court. You know, we will see what the outcome of this trial is, but I would simply remind you that this is not the first time a British court has been asked to look at the same evidence that Didi used to reach these verdicts in the Vatican trial in 2021. An English court was asked to rule on a petition by another Italian financier, Gianluigi Torzi, who wanted his assets unfrozen. That English court concluded that the Vatican was guilty of such serious misrepresentations in its presentation of the evidence that it raised real questions about whether anybody could ever be convicted criminally of anything. Okay, so that's first part. Second, there is a steady but persistent drumbeat of criticism of the Vatican trial in academic circles, there is a, an expert in both civil and canon law by the name of Geraldina Boni, teaches at the University of Bologna. She's also a consultant to the Pontifical Council for Legislative Text, who this week gave an interview to the Roman newspaper Il Messaggero, suggesting that Didi's handling of this case was so flawed that it could lead Italy to refuse to recognize the conclusions of Vatican tribunals. It could lead the European Court of Human Rights to condemn the Vatican with unforeseeable consequences. We'll see how that plays out. Third, there are appeals of the results of the Vatican trial of the century currently before the Vatican's own Court of Appeals, including an appeal from Didi himself, who wants the Court of Appeals to endorse his conspiracy theory 
that all of these defendants acted knowingly in concert with one another, which was rejected by the lower tribunal. This could end in the Court of Appeals basically condemning Didi for prosecutorial overreach. Finally, there is a case in the Vatican brought by the former Auditor General of the Holy See, a layman by the name of Libera Maloney, who was seeking more than $9 million in damages for his firing in 2017. Didi has threatened to prosecute Maloney for alleged misconduct when he was the Auditor General. Now, if Maloney doesn't get satisfaction from Vatican courts, theoretically, he could file a suit in an Italian civil court seeking some kind of compensation. And in that case, Didi's conduct could be entered as evidence, and he could face some kind of censure or sanction from an Italian court. In other words, there are a lot of irons still in the fire on this story, ladies and gentlemen, and on the correct site, we will continue to follow. All right. Finally, this week, we've got a penitential pilgrimage. So, as I said at the top of the show, for the last 11 years, ever since Pope Francis was elected in March 2013, there has been a cottage industry in the Catholic Church. Commentators and activists, you know, self-proclaimed influencers on social media. Frankly, I think the only people they influence are other influencers. But in any event, you know, there has been this whole coterie of personalities who have thrived on pitting Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis against one another, suggesting that they represent rival and opposed contesting visions for the future of Roman Catholicism. And that motif, of course, has also been picked up in a lot of mainstream media reporting and commentary on Roman Catholicism. Now, I don't so much blame people who don't follow the Catholic Church all the time for uncritically imbibing this narrative. However, the propagators of it, people who do live and move and have their being in Catholic environments, perhaps are a little bit more culpable. And for that crowd of people, people who have profited, okay, from peddling this narrative of an opposition between Benedict and Francis, I am here this week to suggest a destination for a penitential pilgrimage, some place you can go to challenge your perspective and potentially cleanse your soul. And that destination is the hillside Italian town of Subiaco, located about an hour and a half to the east of Rome. It is where St. Benedict in the 6th century spent three years as a hermit in a cave, living entirely by himself, having his food lowered, according to tradition anyway, having his food lowered every day into the cave with a rope and then pulled back up. Finally, some local shepherds came to him, discovered him basically in this cave, were so moved, some of them wanted to follow him, and he ended up founding communities, eventually founded 13 separate monasteries in the environment of Subiaco, where he lived another 25 years before relocating to Monte Cassino, and essentially founded Western monasticism. Now, here is the thing that is relevant about the connection between Benedict and Francis. So Subiaco is arguably the single most important center of Benedictine spirituality in the world. There is located, among other things, the Monastery of the Holy Cave, the Monastery of the Sacro Speco, which was founded in the 12th century on the very spot of what tradition regarded as the spot of the cave in which St. Benedict had lived. Now, in this monastery, there is a chapel. It's known as the Chapel of Gregory because it is named for the future Pope Gregory IX, who, when he was a cardinal, Cardinal Ugolini, had been invited to go to the monastery and bless the altar in this new chapel. And when he did so, historians believe he was accompanied by a young man from the Italian city of Assisi who filled with what he believed to be an inspiration from the Holy Spirit was in the process of founding a new apostolic way of life that would eventually become the sprawling Franciscan order. This, of course, was Francis of Assisi. That moment was captured in a painting, a fresco, on the wall of this chapel of Gregory, 
in the monastery of the Holy Cave. It is believed to date from before 1224. 1224 is the year in which tradition says St. Francis received the stigmata, because this shows us a Francis without the stigmata and without the halo that typically denotes a saint in Christian iconography. In other words, it's believed to be a portrait of St. Francis when he was still alive, executed during the course of his lifetime. It is believed, therefore, to be the only real-time, real-world, reliable depiction of what St. Francis actually looked like. It is arguably the most precious, most venerated image of St. Francis in the entire world. And for the last 800 years, where, who has taken care of this image of Francis? It has been Benedictines, who for now 801 years have lovingly, reverentially, devotedly preserved and maintained this image. My wife, Elise, and I recently had the opportunity, all by ourselves, in this hauntingly evocative Chapel of Gregory, to stand before that image and pass a few moments, sort of reverential contemplation. It was a transformative experience. My point is that the link between Benedict and Francis is genetic, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, Benedict represents the monastic instinct to conserve, protect, and defend the deposit of faith. Yes, Francis represents the apostolic instinct to spin that deposit of faith, to innovate, to invent, to be all things to all people. But as G.K. Chesterton once famously put it, what Benedict stored, Francis scattered. In other words, these are not opposing instincts, folks. These are two sides of the same coin. They are inextricably linked. Catholicism is not an either-or tradition. It is a both-and tradition. And this genetic linkage between Benedict and Francis, which is forever memorialized in the Chapel of Gregory, in the Monastery of the Holy Cave, is the classic and quintessential embodiment of this core Catholic truth. So for all of those of you who want to continue to insist there is some necessary opposition between Benedict and Francis, my invitation to you is this. Make your way to Subiaco, spend some time in the Chapel of Gregory, and then we will talk. That's our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all of these stories on the Crux site. That is, of course, cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, independent Catholic journalism. We will be back here next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel. And the next time, or in the meantime, rather, have a fantastic and blessed week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and in the dog days of July, stay cool, and we will talk to you again very soon.